So, you know what people believe. Not by what they say, by how they live. You, you know what people believe. Not by the words that come out of their mouths, but by the attitudes they have around those who may think differently versus those who are a lot like them. Church, do you hear me? You, you know what people believe, um, not just because they go to a particular church and say they believe in certain things, but because of just how they behave. Am I right? We're going to read Psalm 23, and it's a common psalm that most of us know. It's used in funerals quite a bit. And what it says is, it says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. But we define God in many different ways, don't we? I, for one, say that God is love. And in the past, I've read this by saying, love is my shepherd. But, you know, maybe you have a different attitude towards God. And maybe we need to be real with how we believe how we define God. So maybe you'd want to say, compassion is my shepherd. Justice is my shepherd. Judgment is my shepherd. Believe in the right thing all the time so I can be right is my shepherd. What is your shepherd? I'm going to say love because that's mine. But as I read it, think about your words. And think about what you would put in there. Amen? Love is my shepherd. I shall not want. Love makes me lie down in green pastures. Love leads me beside still waters. Love restores my soul. Love leads me in the right path for love's name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley, I fear no evil for love is with me. Love's rod and staff, they comfort me. Love prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemy. Love anoints my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. I know what you believe. Not by what you say how you live. So what is your shepherd? And how is that shepherd guiding you? Let's go to God in prayer. decisions that are right and pleasing and loving towards you. But Lord, we are confident that you walk with us and guiding us. So Lord, let love fill us and lead us. Let grace hold our hands and let justice flow through us. Guide us and lead us. Hear us as we pray the prayer Jesus taught his disciples by our saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Friends, please be seated. And children, please join me in our time together.
going to sing um, Crowded Table um, as performed by the High Women.
of the blessings I get is I get to hear Jeff or practice that song at home. And it's a pleasure. I married up. And uh, yeah, I married up. And I know I've said this before, and I'm just going to say it again. So I'll be gone in what, two months? I, well, I'm not going to get sad about it, right? But the, the truth is, preachers are replaceable. They, they really are. Jennifer's not. <laughs> and so, um, they're going to miss you more than me now. I mean, that's not really true. No. <laughs> so Jennifer sung this song, Crowded Table by the High Women. And there's a line in that song, I don't know if you heard it, and it said, if it's love that we give, then it's love that we reap. Did you hear that time? Did you hear that segment? But sometimes when you do what is good and what is right, sometimes when you do what is loving, it can be met with whining and complaining. You ever been there? When you do something good, you do something right, and people just complain and whine about it? I love to cook. But sometimes a six-year-old is way too honest about the food. And oftentimes, well, I, I will spend time and care and love and effort, and I will make this meal for my son, well, really my family. And the comment is, Daddy, why'd you make that? You don't like filet mignon, son? I'm joking, that's not what I made. <laughs> Fish sticks, that's right, he loves fish sticks, which is horrible. <laughs> you ever been there where people, where you do something right and loving and kind and good and it's met with complaining and whining? One time I was walking in downtown Greenville with a, with a fellow youth minister, and as we were walking down the, the street going to lunch, the, uh, there was a homeless person, and the homeless person was begging for some food or some money. And so I gave five dollars. And the uh, fellow youth manager said, you should never give homeless people your money. It, it is terrible. It is wrong. And he berated me the whole time for it. I just thought I did something good and right and loving. So we go to lunch. And we eat and talk. And, you know, we didn't really talk about what happened. And when the bill came, I said, I was going to get your meal, but I gave it to the homeless guy. <laughs> <laughs> hey, he said, you're a jerk, man. <laughs> but I know we've been there. And when we do something right and good and loving and it's met with whining and complaining, it can be discouraging and frustrating, can it? In John's Gospel, Jesus always did what was good. He always did what was right and he always did what was loving. And he healed a blind man who was begging on the streets, a man who was suffering from extreme poverty, a man who was marginalized by society. But after healing this man, some of the religious leaders had the audacity to whine and to complain. And that's the context we find ourselves in when Jesus calls himself the Good Shepherd. He is responding to whining and complaining. And the truth is, this healing should have been celebrated. Shouldn't it have? Shouldn't it have? Not just because this man was helped where he said, I was blind, but now I see. But because it goes back to John chapter 1. Remember, everything in John's gospel goes back to John chapter 1. In the beginning was the word. So this was more than a mere healing. This was the Word. This was the Logos. Those universal truths that transcend religion and culture. Those universal truths that are shared by all. For instance, all want joy and laughter, don't they? When I go to Japan to visit my family, we sit around a table finding ways to laugh. 
just as I do with you when we go to lunch after church. All want to live a life of dignity, don't they? And so when Jesus healed this blind man, some universal truths were made known. The universal truth of justice was made known because this man was set free to live a life of dignity because of what Jesus did. The universal truth of compassion was made known because this man was well again and can live a life of worth because of what Jesus did. The universal truth of love was made known because this man was made whole again to live out new possibilities because of what Jesus did. And instead of celebrating what Jesus did, the religious leader wanted to do some investigating. Instead of being thankful, they wanted to be critical. And that's a thing people do, isn't it? You know, if we don't like someone, we will find reasons to justify that dislike. We see it in our political and social discourse, don't we? We, we see it when a political leader can come up with a great idea, a fantastic idea. But someone will get disgusted with them, looking at them with hate and disdain because there was an R or a D next to their name. You ever do that? I do it. Come on. Come on. Oh, man, that's a great idea. Oh, look who said it. No. <laughs> Come on, church. Not your dad. Unless I'm the only one that does that, then I'm really embarrassed. <laughs> no matter what people try to do to make things better, someone will be critical and hateful, not because the movement was bad or the movement was a bad idea, but because the movement was labeled liberal or conservative. You ever do that? Jesus did a good and right and loving thing, only to be questioned and criticized by those who was threatened by him. But Jesus relented and said this, I am the good shepherd. He said he was not some hired hand who can be intimidated by overwhelming challenges or scared off by sneaky predators or become lazy and apathetic. Jesus was taking ownership of what he was doing and ownership changes our perspective. Ownership cha changes our responsibilities. For instance, Jennifer and I own a house. We love our house, don't we? I'm obsessed with my house. It, it's our forever home. Do you guys have a forever home now? This is our forever home. And we love it because it's a great house built in 1920. And it's in a great neighborhood within walking distance of downtown Greenville. But right now it's a rental. And right now it's currently empty. And so I'm going over there two or three times a week to do some work on it so we can rent it out again for our next tenants. And I got to tell you something. I can't help but notice when we lived there, when Jennifer and I lived there and it was our home, the yard was immaculate. Uh, the garden was beautiful. I learned what annuals and perennials were by mistake. They tell a funny story. So one day I was like, I'm going to clean up this garden. And I did. And I cleaned up that garden and it was looking great because it was fall, so it was barren. And I was like, Jennifer, look at what I did to the garden. And all of a sudden, she's like, I can't believe you did that. And she said, because apparently oak leaf hydrangeas are a big deal. <laughs> and it takes a while to grow. And they're kind of costly, I learned. Um, but you know, they come out of the ground really easily. <laughs> and my wife's looking at me like, yeah, I still am at it. There were no weeds in that garden. The place was kept up. The, the, the front porch didn't have any cobwebs. There was no dust. 
It was a beautiful house. And we've had great tenants. We really have really great tenants. But they don't, they don't do what we did. And why should they? It's not their house. They, they will all move in knowing that they will move on. Church, do you hear me? We take care of those things that belong to us. We, we take care of those things that are important to us. We take care of those things that are meaningful to us. Jesus is saying he's the good shepherd, and it was more than the title of a revolutionary. It was the word made into flesh, taking on the cosmic responsibility of bringing heaven to earth to all people, because all are loved, even a blind man no one cared for. Jesus, the word made into flesh, bore the responsibility of justice, no matter what his detractor said, keeping his eye on freeing the oppressed. He didn't worry about the backlash from those who, who profited off of injustice or, or benefited from inequality and rose up to fight his message. He said he's the good shepherd saying that he will make sure that justice will keep rolling like a river. Jesus, the word made into flesh for the responsibility of compassion, even around those who are apathetic to his cause, making sure all knew that they were valued. He could care less about the hostile responses from lack of, compa of compassion, and from those who found ways to justify their lack of compassion. You ever meet those people? You ever been those people? I've been those. He said, I'm the good shepherd. And I'll make sure that the hungry are fed and the homeless are sheltered no matter the sacrifice. Jesus, the word made flesh, bore the responsibility of love, even if it meant being hated by others. He didn't concern himself with critics or haters. He didn't concern himself with critics or haters who thought that love was a weakness or that love is naive or unrealistic. He said, I'm the good shepherd and made sure that those walls that divide us came down. And Jesus did take down those walls, walls that people still try to build. Jesus took down racist walls when he, a Jewish person, crossed the sea to help Gentiles. Jesus took down political walls when he, a Jewish leader, had compassion for a Roman centurion. Jesus took down those theological walls when he, a revolutionary and reformer, welcomed Nicodemus, another leader who had different ideas. He showed the world that love is not weakness and that love is not naive and that love takes down those walls that divide us and takes those walls and turns those walls into crowded tables that unite us. Jesus said he was a good shepherd and a good shepherd takes full responsibility of always choosing justice without apology, of always choosing compassion without question, and of always choosing love and never second guessing it. And here's the good news. This passage says we belong to the word. We belong to justice. We belong to love. We belong to compassion. We belong to God. The word is our shepherd. And in a world where people are still oppressed, where inequality and injustice still exist, keep the faith because justice will come. And in a world where people are still suffering, where poverty and neglect are still rampant, have hope because compassion will come. And in a world where hatred and rage often surround us, know that you are at love. Be at peace. Because nothing can separate you from that love. But the world knowing justice, compassion, and love doesn't just happen automatically, does it? 
Roger had to leave. Yeah. <laughs> Justice and compassion don't come by our just waiting for it. And love isn't passive. Brothers and sisters, we are the hands and feet of God called to bear the responsibility of justice, seeking ways to bring heaven to earth for all people, even when it means some will hate you for it. That we are called to bear the responsibility of compassion and feed the hungry and help the homeless and, and embolden the disenfranchised, even when it means being criticized by others. That we are called to bear the responsibility of love, seeing all people, all people, even the neighbor who lives that way, or, or the co-worker who voted for that person, or the person who believes differently, seeing all people as made in the image of God to be welcomed and to be treated with dignity and respect. We, like Jesus, are called to be good shepherds, not mere hands, but shepherds. To be shepherds like Jesus, showing the world that love overcomes all things. To be shepherds like Jesus, reaching out and welcoming all people and seeing God's beauty in our diversity. To be shepherds like Jesus, taking down those walls to build crowded tables where love is obvious and evident. The Word is our shepherd. And those universal truths lead us to bring heaven to earth. Amen? Amen. Amen. And I forgot my word for something on The church in the wildwood. Church in the wildwood, yes. Thank you.
Brothers and sisters, please join me in the statement of faith found in your bulletin. Please read with me. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who works in others and us through the Spirit. We follow in the way of Jesus, celebrating God's presence, living with respect in creation, loving and serving others, seeking justice and resisting injustice, and seeking out hope and peace. We believe every person, regardless of color, religion, creed, age, class, or orientation, is a child of God. We are connected because we are family. We gather because we all have something to share. We encourage one another and hold each other accountable. But most of all, we love one another. Thanks be to God. Amen. Brothers and sisters, have you been blessed this morning? Yes. Hear now the benediction. You are called to be shepherds. Shepherds in a world that needs guiding and love, grace, and compassion. Be who you're called to be. Until next week, amen? Amen.